mimi mwai kibaki na hapa kwamba nitakuwa mwaminifu wa jamhuri ya Kenya becoming a president a crowning moment for any person from any family Kenyans have voted fought and died to elect their presidents Only one Kenyan family has experienced this two times. The Kenyatas. In 2013, 60 years after his father became Kenya's first president, Uhuru Kenyatta rode to power in an election where his supporters claimed that he was too rich to be corrupted. Where I'd vote for you as a leader, it was even something like for a president that you already have a wealthy background so you see no need to steal um you already born into power the kenyatas were the epitome of kenyan aristocracy wanting to be seen to be above the corruption of other political elite that had for years ruined kenyan lives but confidential documents exposing a network of secretive offshore companies belonging to members of the kenyatta family now cast this legacy in new light the global leak is called the pandora papers it's a vast archive of never before seen documents from 14 service providers who sell secrecy to rich clients from around the world this leak is really panama papers on steroids this is the pandora papers because we think we're opening a box on a lot of things. We're looking at about 12 million documents from 14 different service providers. These are law firms and um, firms that set up secret offshore accounts for people in multiple jurisdictions. In the case of the Kenyatas, the Pandora Papers detail ownership of an expensive home in an exclusive UK neighborhood and an investment portfolio belonging to one of them over 30 million US dollars. The investigation has not found any evidence to suggest corruption relating to the first family. What it has found is a trove of documents showing that members of the family have used offshore locations for at least 10 years. The Kenyatas are a very wealthy family with wealth that stretches into the hundreds of millions of dollars and spans numerous sectors of Kenya's economy. They founded what is now the largest dairy company in Kenya and co-own one of Kenya's largest private banks. For a family with such deep roots in Kenya's economy, their foray into the world of offshore networks begs the question, why the investment in global secrecy networks? The family surname comes from Jomo Kenyatta, Kenya's first president. Seen as one of the founding fathers of the republic, Kenyatta was imprisoned by the British colonial regime, released after 8 years in 1961. He would be sworn in as prime minister 2 years later, then became president in a constitutional change in 1964. At the same time, Jomo Kenyatta's wealth began to grow, mostly through acquisition of large tracts of land previously owned by European settlers. 1962 there was the Lancaster House conference and that conference one of the most intractable of issues was the question of what do we do to the white settlement in Kenya and what do we do to the land question in Kenya where even the British government from 1932 had set up the Catalan Commission and the agreement was that um, land would be obtained by the Kenya government by buying it from the white settlers but unfortunately they haven't they didn't bring in equity in terms of our dispossessed thousands and thousands of families who today still languish in a lot of poverty because without employment in this country and without land you are an enslaved person standing beside Jomo Kenyatta was his fourth wife Ngena Kenyatta better known as Mama Ngena Kenyatta married off to the 61 year old Kenyatta at the age of 18 Mama Ngena would as first lady 
become entangled in some controversial deals. Then, in 1978, Jomo Kenyatta died and power passed from him to his vice president, Daniel Arap Moy. The 24 years of Moy's rule entrenched a kleptocracy founded under Jomo Kenyatta. These were quiet years for the Kenyattas, who carried on consolidating their wealth. The time away from Kenya's seat of power also allowed for a renewal of the Kenyatta name, which, by 1978, had been mentioned in connection to controversy. But 24 years later, in 2002, a young Uhuru Kenyatta, Mamangena's oldest son, would be thrust into Kenyan politics, running to succeed President Moi. A few years after, overtures to secrecy jurisdictions by family members were made. And over time, they became sophisticated players in the offshore world. I, Uhuru Kenyatta. What the Pandora Papers leaks reveal is a complex web of companies, foundations, and trusts owned by members of the Kenyatta family in secrecy jurisdictions, holding millions of dollars worth of assets belonging to members of Kenya's first family. Trusts, shell companies, and foundations have legitimate and legal uses, but as has been observed, especially in the wake of the world's largest global documents leak, these entities are often used to hide wealth by the corrupt and criminal elite across the world. It is really manipulating the legal framework. And that's why they are lawyers, obviously, to manipulate the, that you are actually moving within the grey area. The first instance where members of President Kenyatta's immediate family are mentioned goes back to 1999. Advisors from the private wealth division of Swiss bank Union Bancaire Privé, which would later be known to have aided former President Moy and Nigerian strongman General Sani Abacha to stash their wealth overseas, contacted Panamanian law firm Aleman, Cordero, Galindo and Lee, known better as Alcogal, to incorporate a company in the British Virgin Islands. The company, Milran International, was incorporated on February the 10th, 1999, with three registered shareholders, Christina Pratt, Nyokabi Modama, and their mother, Mamangena Kenyatta. Both daughters held 24,500 shares each, or 98% of the company, with the family's matriarch holding 1,000 shares. While the documents show that the three were shareholders of the company, Milran International had two nominee directors who were both employees of Alcogal, the law firm that set it up. One of them, Andres Sanchez, also provided nominee director services to a frontman acting for Chilean dictator Augusto Pinochet. A year after Milran International was incorporated, it purchased a property in London for £280,000. By 2021 property value estimates, the apartment would be worth almost £1 million. Ask for its owners, and the trail would lead back to nominee directors working for Alcogal and an address that seems to have nothing to do with the Kenyattas. In 2004, another layer of secrecy is added. The Kenyatta women transfer all their shares in Milran International to a new entity called Valberg International Incorporated, not in the BVI, but in Panama. So, in real terms, Valberg Foundation in Panama owns Milran International in the BVI, which has nominee directors from a law firm, and Milran International owns a property in London. At least, that's how it looked as of 2004. But that's not where this trail into secrecy ends. In 2007, Maclay Foundation is incorporated in Panama. The 50,000 shares that Valberg Foundation held were split evenly between the two foundations. Both Valberg Foundation and Maclay have nominee directors. Like Russian dolls, these entities seem to be separate but are part of one well-planned play at secrecy. BVI is management fees and um, Panama is, I've just seen, mainly secrecy. So, so 
those are their game plans. A Panamanian foundation allows the donor of money to the foundation and the recipient of money from the foundation to be one and the same individuals. You can create a Panamanian foundation. You can donate money to your Panamanian foundation, and you can make yourself the beneficiary of the charity of your Panamanian foundation. Of course, escaping identification and taxes uh, all along uh, uh, the way. Uh, this clearly differs from a normal company, which is required to uh, uh, register, uh, produce accounts, um, and so forth. Uh, Panamanian foundations um, facilitate uh, secrecy as well as any other entities in the world. We asked Mamangina Kenyatta and her daughters, Christina Pratt and Yokabi Modama, why they would need such a complex web of foundations and companies in Panama and the BVI to own one apartment. We also asked whether anything else was owned by any one of these entities. There are different reasons people would invest. I mean, um, if you're not a leader or a political elite, your, your child is studying abroad, do you want them to have a place to live with? Then fine, you can afford it. Awesome, right? But apart from that, I don't understand why. But the tree of companies, trusts, and foundations that are linked to the family flowers in different directions and also includes the president, his younger brother, Mohoho Kenyatta. These things happened around the time that Kenya was going through an important political transition. In 2002, Kenyans went to the polls for a pivotal election. The 24-year rule of President Daniel Arap Moi was coming to an end. Since 1978, when he succeeded Uhuru Kenyatta's father, Jomo Kenyatta, Moi presided over one of Kenya's darkest chapters. His rule was marked by economic collapse, the brutalizing of political opponents, runaway corruption, the imposition of structural adjustment programs, and the disposing of government assets at throwaway prices, many times to people close to power. Moi, known for his mastery of Kenyan politics, was expected to choose his successor from his coterie of loyal politicians. Instead, he went for someone from outside his circle of cronies. <laughs> At the time, Uhuru was unelected with less than 10 years in active politics. Opposition candidates who had been beaten twice before by Moi chose to unite and before long, a political contest unlike any Kenya had ever seen before was in the offing. Moi's candidate Uhuru lost and a new day dawned for Kenya. <laughs> as soon as Parliament reconvenes, bring the law, we should establish the anti-corruption act. To his credit, Uhuru Kenyatta, now the leader of Kenya's opposition, publicly dared then-President Mwai Kibaki to go after Moi-era kleptocrats, who, according to a leaked report by corporate investigations firm Kroll Associates, asserted that Moi and many of his allies had stashed wealth abroad in offshore locations. We are ready to stand the test of time. Corruption is not about political parties. Corruption is about individuals. Corruption is about a few individuals who choose to use state resources to benefit themselves. If indeed the government feels that they are individuals who should be prosecuted, it is their responsibility to prosecute those individuals, not to continue to harp and live in the past. It is my responsibility as the leader of the official opposition in this country to ensure that the government takes action on today's corruption. 
but privately. The Pandora Papers now reveal that at the same time, his family was looking into the world of offshore secrecy as well. Again, with the help from the private wealth arm of Swiss bank UBP, now called Apex Consulting, and Panamanian law firm Alcogal, an entity called Varys Foundation was set up in the historically renowned secrecy haven of Panama. Documents show that Mamangina Kenyatta is listed as the first beneficiary of the foundation, with President Uhuru Kenyatta listed as the second beneficiary. This means that all assets in the foundation will be managed so as to financially benefit Uhuru Kenyatta upon Mamangena's death. Just two weeks after Varys was established, Cressel Foundation was set up, using the same nominees as Varys and Mill Run International before it. Cressel's first beneficiary was listed as Mohoho Kenyatta, with his son Jomo Kamau Mohoho Kenyatta listed as the second beneficiary. His son was an infant at the time. The Kenyatta's use of secrecy jurisdictions during the period of political transition has also been observed in other regions facing political instability, with people turning to secrecy jurisdictions to secure their wealth as their home nations battle difficulties. We asked President Kenyatta and Mamangina Kenyatta why Vary's foundation was set up and whether President Kenyatta included this as part of his wealth declaration to the Ministry of Finance. The source of the Kenyatta's vast wealth has been, at least in part, an open question since the days of Kenya's independence. Our founding fathers of this nation built businesses, farmed hard, sought new knowledge, and practiced politics of unity and democracy even when they argued amongst themselves. On 12th December 1963, Kenya became a self-governing state, completely independent. It was, perhaps, the most hopeful time in Kenya's history. Jomo Kenyatta, a man once described by colonial functionaries as a leader unto darkness and death, having been linked with the freedom struggle fought by Kenya's iconic Mau Mau rebels, was now the man in charge of a newly independent Kenya. The hope and his promise to Kenyans was that he would do three things. Invest in health, improve Kenya's wealth, and educate the population. But before long, wealth began to be concentrated in the hands of his family and a tight circle of his trusted allies, drawn mostly from his own tribe. By 1965, Kenya's treasury was being investigated by the World Bank over claims of misappropriation of millions of dollars meant for the purchase of land to resettle Kenya's poor and dispossessed population. By that time, laws had been changed to vest power in Kenyatta to allocate land under title in Kenya. There was instruction from the Kibaki government that uh, all public authorities reported to it in terms of land which could have been surrendered from the public authority to individuals. And in respect of the Kenyatta family, there was one report that came in about uh, four public houses which were located on Ragati Road in Nairobi. They had been used previously for the building of, uh, of residential houses for public staff. And what Kenyatta did was to amalgamate the four plots that ended up being close to uh, two acres, three acres, and he amalgamated that even though government policy all along in terms of public land has been that uh, it should be demised to any individual on a leasehold so that the government from year to year can be getting rent, land uh, rent from uh, the, the individual, Kenyatta amalgamated and gave that as freehold to Mamangena. Over the nearly two decades of Jomo Kenyatta's rule, the Kenyatta's wealth in land seemed to have grown to a vastness that had only been witnessed during colonial times. By 1978, the Kenyatta's were said to have owned hundreds of thousands of acres. A now declassified report by the US Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, 
written days after Jomo Kenyatta's death, stated and quote, the family and closest associate have occupied many key posts in the Kenyan economy and have accumulated extensive agricultural and commercial wealth during the 15 years of Kenyatta's rule. When Jomo Kenyatta died in 1978, a new corrupt regime led by Daniel Arap Moy let the family nurture their wealth. By 2002, the Kenyattas had holdings in the tourism industry, one of Kenya's most successful milk companies, a private bank, and even more land. They also had the veneer of respectability earned over this period of time when the sins of the Moy regime spoke far more loudly than questions about the Kenyatta's wealth could. In 2002, the Kenyatta's appeared to be a heartbeat away for a second term of the presidency. Absolutely. But the chance was lost, and by the following year, members of the family were looking to secrecy jurisdictions. The advisors that members of the Kenyatta family chose are interesting in and of themselves. They used the wealth planning arm of Swiss bank Union Bancaire Privé, who then helped set up some of their companies in the BVI and their foundations in Panama. UBP was an interesting choice, also having been used by former President Daniel Arap Moy, as well as Nigerian dictator General Sani Abacha, but why rely on secrecy jurisdictions? The purpose, broadly speaking, is the accumulation of wealth in a hidden manner. Tax havens, in their essence, sell two things, really. They exist to sell two things. One, they sell secrecy. And then secondly, they sell low or zero taxation. That's how they survive, that's how they have become rich, that's, that's really what a tax haven is. So when we talk of tax havens, really they are, they are the tip of the iceberg. Below the iceberg there are layers and layers and layers of, of actors that facilitate, enable, oil um, the, the secrecy networks to, to function and exist. Most of the Kenyatta's interests in trusts that we have seen are hidden behind layer upon layer of nominee shareholders and directors from the Panamanian law firm that they used. Alcogal. From the Pandora Papers leak, Alcogal is among frequently used law firms in the movement of wealth into secrecy jurisdictions around the world. Every single element of this has been created by us in the Western countries. Not a single piece of this has been created by corrupt government officials or criminals or terrorist financiers. No, this is all our doing in order to serve that money that wants to come out of other economies into our economies. While it is not illegal to set up trusts or foundations in offshore locations, President Uhuru Kenyatta, a beneficiary of the Varys Foundation, set up by Alcogal in 2003, may need to explain the reasoning behind setting up a foundation like Varys with him as a second beneficiary, as opposed to one in Kenya. Kenyan laws prohibit state officials from running foreign bank accounts or maintaining assets outside of Kenya unless expressly declared. President Kenyatta's wealth and liabilities declarations have never been made public, so it is unclear what is in there. Questions to Alcogal and Trident Trust were posed about whether they interrogate who their clients are and the source of their funds. Both Alcogal and Trident responded. A spokesperson for Trident commented saying the following, Trident Trust Group is a global provider of professional, corporate, fund, and trust administration services. Each of Trident's trust and corporate services businesses is regulated in the jurisdiction in which it operates and is fully committed to compliance with all applicable regulations. Trident routinely cooperates with any competent authority which requests information. Trident does not discuss its clients with the media. Alcogal also gave a response, saying that, and quote, as a general rule, being classified as a politically exposed person, PEP, does not automatically disqualify a person from consideration to be a client of any service provider in any industry, and Alcogal is not an exception. However, we follow a strict evaluation process for all cases. The first requirement is that the individual must be referred to Alcogal 
by a reputable professional entity. According to the analysis of the documents we have seen, the Kenyatta's activities in secrecy jurisdictions would be done in waves. In the first flurry between 1999 and 2004, then in the second between 2008 and 2014. By the year 2008, President Kenyatta was no longer a politician outside the circle of power. And we as Kanu are in and for supporting the position that will see His Excellency the President re-elected for a second term. In 2007's highly disputed Kenyan election, Kenyatta supported incumbent President Mwai Kibaki's bid. The wake of that election saw Kenya brought to its knees in what is now euphemistically called the post-election violence. The country's economy ground to a virtual halt, growing at 0.2% compared to 6.9% the year before. Three years later, in 2011, according to documents from the Pandora Papers leak, President Kenyatta's younger brother, Mohoho, was quite active in the offshore world of financial secrecy. Mohoho Kenyatta is publicly reputed as the latter-day gatekeeper of the Kenyatta family's wealth. From the documents we have seen, in 2011, Mohoho builds his own branch of investments. Documents show that a Dubai-based accounting firm uses Trident Trust, another fund administrator, as its registered agent to set up Galanis Finance Limited. Mohoho Kenyatta holds 1,000 shares in Galanis Finance. The following year, this time through nominee companies of a global bank used as shareholders, Trident Trust registers two more companies for Mohoho. These are Hawkins International Limited and Leonor Estates Inc., both registered in the British Virgin Islands. It is through Hawkins International that the Pandora Papers gives a glimpse into the wealth that may be held by the Kenyattas. An internal document dated November 29, 2016, lists Mohoho as having a portfolio of investments worth 31.6 million US dollars or 3 billion Kenya shillings held in Hong Kong and London. Other documents list him owning varied kinds of assets like cash accounts, mutual assets and various equities. But he isn't the only one using these networks to keep his wealth. The Kenyattas aren't the only Kenyans who have relied on secrecy jurisdictions like Panama and the British Virgin Islands. The leak includes many more. But why should this matter to Kenyans? We know the definition of Wanjiko, right? Um, runs a little farm, has about three or four kids, is a single mom, finished high school, um, and basically feeds her kids off her little garden and then sells a bit off for the school fees and the books. That's our survivalist human being in Kenya today. And that was coined actually by President Moy, incidentally. So, so if that is Wanjiku, why should Wanjiku care? Wanjiku should care because if that money belongs to government, either it was tax money that has not been collected, then maybe Wanjiku would not have to worry about the clothing on her for school uniforms and wouldn't have to worry about books because that taxpayer money could have been used to pay that. Natamani kwa na nyumbani, lakini najipata sina shamba na sina mali pa kujenga. Iyo Kenya ilienda waki. Kwa nini walio navi wanaongezewa na wasio kuwa navi wanazidi kufingili wa chini. Na uliza uhuru, why? Kwa nini? Kwa nini tuangaike na sisi tuko Kenya? If political leaders are using secrecy havens, this can be taken as a sign for others who may want to do so for tax reasons. This leads to capital flight in a country that needs every cent it can get. That's your money. That's, it's, that's your money. The, 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 there's no better way to put it. It is, it is your money. Why? Because if if a particular elite who earned income or from his business, who earned profits from whatever his business is doing and is not going to pay his requisite tax, where is the government going to go? It's going to come to your pocket. Kenyans are facing perhaps their biggest test yet, with debt 
caused in large part by theft and misappropriation of borrowed funds, threaten the country's near-term future. President Kenyatta has gone on record seeking transparency in Kenya's economic affairs, yet his family has benefited from the cloak of secrecy offered by offshore jurisdictions. In mid-August 2021, a public debate broke out about the sources of wealth of Kenya's deputy president, William Ruto. Soon, the Kenyattas themselves had their names drawn into the mudslinging. On all sides, questions were asked about the source of each party's wealth. Walisahau pia kuweka shares. Niko na shares, 400,000 ya safariko. Walisahau kusema ile biashara yangu ya kuku, niliona wanaandika eka rich. Sasa pale wangeandika iko kuku elfu miambili. Na wangesema huyu mtu anauza mayai 150,000 every day shilingi 1.5 million. Most of the vitriol directed at the person and family of the founding father of our nation Mzee Jomo Kenyatta who is not here to defend himself. As a party we are sending the deputy president William Ruto a public message that we will not countenance his venturing into crossing this line of referring to the family of the president, the late president Mzee Jomo Kenyatta. In 2022, Kenya will elect a new leader. This time around, election narratives are being framed around debt and wealth inequality. While the Kenyattas don't have anyone with their surname on the ticket, a country that their kin have led twice over seems poised to have a public debate about who truly owns Kenya. The Pandora Papers, a leak from the heart of secrecy thousands of miles away, may yet make for a most important conversation starter. Yeah, you should be, you should be seriously worried if your political elite, and it's in any country in the world, is investing outside their country. Because it shows you don't have faith in your country. Yeah. That's really what it says. And if you're the leader or you're the ruling elite, that basically means you don't even trust your own leadership. Because you don't even want to put your own money under your own control in your own country. That is the message we see from our fiscal legitimacy.